Okay, so um, welcome back to our uh, workshop on integrable systems in mathematics, condensed matter physics, and statistical physics. Uh, we have uh, Maithili Ramaswamy from DFR CAM, a uh, professor of mathematics, who is offered to give us a, a, a review of some of the stuff that she's been working on, uh, specifically, uh, is control of linear viscoelastic models. And uh, it's my understanding she'll highlight some connections to things like Dirichlet to Neumann maps and control theory. No, okay. Well, sorry for promising. <laughs> anyway, please pay, uh, take it up. Thank you, Vishal. And I thank uh, Rukmini and Vishal for inviting me to this conference. I'm really enjoying uh, to see the various talks. Uh, I'm afraid I may not be uh, directly linked to the integrable systems, nor uh, the Riemann-Hilbert transforms or what David has been doing. But uh, there are similar ideas which uh, can be used. In particularly, they have been using the transforms to get the expression for the solution. And in our case, we are using transform, particularly in my case, I'm using Laplace transform and again complex analysis, but to get certain properties of uh, this the solution. And there is some analyticity hiding behind and so that is the link, uh, although there is no directly Dirichlet Neumann map. So let's see if uh, I can communicate my ideas to some extent. So um, this will be on control of linear elastic models. So I'll try to introduce the concepts of, uh, basic concepts of control, what I want to discuss in the case of ODE systems and PDE systems. And once the idea is clear and then I try to, the model which uh, uh, I wanted to take was viscoelastic theory. It's a complicated PDE model. It's a system coupled system. But once we know what is the idea in the ODE system, we can see how we go through because you are familiar with spectral analysis and you are familiar with the orthonormal expansions and you are familiar with Laplace transform. So that is the one we have to mix and get something in some cases. So I'll try to take you through this. Uh, let's see. Okay. So the basic uh, problem we want to ask in uh, the basic question we ask in uh, control theory is, you have a differential equation evolving in some space. It could be an Euclidean n-dimensional space for the ODE or a PDE uh, evolving in some function space, which could be a Sobolev space, H1, H2, whatever you choose. And I can put it as an equation evolving in Rn or evolving in some Hilbert space x dot is ax plus b u t. x is a function of t. So x dot of t is a x t b u t. a, let us take it to be a linear operator here. And uh, initial condition is some x naught. Now the question is, uh, how do we steer the solution trajectory x t to, of the differential equation towards a desired profile using the control u t? Now the b is the given control operator. And we want to choose ut in such a way that the resulting uh, profile is uh, what you want. So the control operator B may act on uh, some of the components of the equations. It may not act on all the components. And in the case of PDEs, it may act on only on subset of the domain or on parts of the boundary. A typical problem is uh, we have this room which we want to maintain in 24 degrees Celsius, let's say. And I want to cool it uh, with uh, air conditioners put on the window or some air conditioner in the middle of the room. So if it is, if I'm putting it on the window, it will be like boundary control. If I put it in the middle of the room, it will be like interior control. The twist, but you also have a cost to pay. So you want to minimize the cost, you want to maintain the temperature at time, let's say in 10 minutes, uh, to reach at 24 degrees everywhere. And you have perturbations because all of us are sitting and breathing and so it is going to change the evolution of the temperature profile. So this is a typical problem practically everyone wants to understand. So I put it in this abstract PDE setup and generally we ask uh, how to construct this UT. Typically if this 
is given as a function of uh, the solution xt, it's all the better. That is called feedback control. And we would be able to compute uh, numerically and implement it as and when we need. Okay, so the aim is to choose a control so that xt, uh, x at capital time t reaches a desired state. But the question is whether it is controllable or not is not an easy question. So first of all, before building the UT, which will be an optimal control problem, we want to know whether the system is controllable. That is the question I'm going to address. So the control UT in my setup will take some uh, values in some Hilbert space in a subspace U of H. In the ODE setup, it could be some RM Euclidean space. Now I take B to be a bounded linear operator from one Hilbert space to the state space, which is H, another Hilbert space. Uh, the yeah, uh, it, you may or uh, yeah, usually the you can use the initial conditions. Uh, it may be given. Okay, so in the ODE case, there may be parameters also. If you are asking whether the initial condition can be used as a control, that can also be done. If either you use the initial condition or uh, the parameters in the system, any of these are possible in the ODE case, even in the PDE case the boundary conditions or initial conditions or the parameters. Is that what you are asking? A and B are given. Uh, no, suppose, so there are different problems. Suppose you are given the initial condition, then corresponding to that x0, you may choose some u, so that you reach x1 you may have an aim, x1 you want to reach. So, or you want to track the enemy territory, let's say, the plane wants to go into the enemy territory and come back. So, you know the initial condition, you want to reach and come back. So, that could be the control, how, what you choose will also depend on the x1. Okay. So, the uh, first I, we want to know what is controllability, because before building the control, yes, B is a for matrix. If you are in dealing with ODE, it's a, it's generally a bounded linear operator. If you are in the RN situation, it will be given by a matrix, RN to RM. Or if you are in the function space setup, it will be going from some Hilbert control Hilbert space to another control Hilbert space. In the case of heat equation, this could be going from L2 functions on the boundary to the functions uh, defined on the whole space. So something like that you can imagine. Okay, so we want to know the system, uh, what is the meaning of controllability? That means I should be able to go from one point to any point in the space, right? X naught, any X naught to X1. There must be a control UT, admissible control, because sometimes you may also have a constraint on the control. Any control may not work. You may want L2 controls or you may want L infinity control. So depend admissible control must be there to allow you to go from one point to another, any arbitrary point to arbitrary point. So if you want to analyze when a system is controllable, you have to write down the solution in this form, which is uh, uh, the usual thing we do with the differential equation. So this comes from the initial condition and this comes from the right hand side, so, uh, right -hand side source term. So B is the control operator, U is the control. Now, if you want to reach any point x1, I should have this operator uh, uh, reach any point in the space. That tells me that I have to study this operator, ft, which is this integral 0 to capital T of u. So, the u I put in this space, which is all L2 integrable functions taking values in u. Okay, so L2 of 0 t u means these are all uh, as a function of t for each t, the value is sitting in u, okay, and the correspondence is L2 integrable. So this goes into h because this integral finally gives you a value in h. So we want this to be reaching any point in h. So that means I want the image of ft should be the whole of h, the range or the range of ft should be the whole of h. So we have transformed the question to a functional analysis question. I have an operator, whether this operator is surjective. So 
So that could be one way of looking at it. So FT is subjective as you, we saw in uh, PDE theory, very often we go to the adjoint problem, it simplifies our life. And you can do <coughs> integration by parts and write down another integral identity, which will give you more information. So that is what we are, we are going to do. So FT is subjective, we know again, we can go to the adjoint operator, FT star. FT was going from here to here, so it will go from H star to the dual of this. H is Hilbert, so H star is H, but I just want to stress that I'm taking the dual from here to here. So then the norm of this, it must be 1, 1 basically, that is what, uh, on to uh, if and only if that joint is 1, 1, that is what I'm trying to write down. Ft star yt, yt is the terminal value, which will be bounded by the norm of yt. So I want to write it in mathematical inequality. So first let us write down the adjoint operator that naturally involves an adjoint system. It could be either adjoint ODE system or adjoint PDE system. And initially we had an initial value problem. So the adjoint problem will be a terminal value problem. And then you get, uh, you uh, integrate by parts, compare the two and you will be able to write down what is FT star of YT. So B star of Y, y dot. So the, this is the adjoint operator. Now the B, typically for me, the B will be a control operator, let's say localized in the domain. Let me say the this is the AC put in a small subset of the domain. So B star will be again a localization operator. So I can take it as a characteristic function of a subset of omega. So if you keep that picture, it will be easy to go on. So now what I have to do is uh, I have to seek conditions on the adjoint operator so that uh, controllability results for the original system can be derived. So as we saw, the adjoint operator has to be 1, 1. It should be the norm must be bounded below. So we compare the two system. What I mean is I multiply the x dot equation by yt and then I integrate by parts. And when I integrate by parts, I will get a y dot. And for y dot, I substitute a star of yt. And here uh, that some things will cancel. And finally, what will remain is the terminal value and the initial value, which I have written xt yt minus x naught y naught. So we got an integral identity by looking at the original system and the adjoint system. In the case of uh, ODE, it will be just a scalar product in Rn. But if you are in the PDE system, they will be, these are all elements of some function space. Typically imagine some L2 space. So it could be L2 in a product between these two functions and uh, here also L2 in a product. And this is also, these are all functions sitting in some Hilbert space. So this will be some Hilbert space in a product uh, in X. That's why X I'm not carrying. The X will be the inner product and T is uh, integrated out from zero to T. Now from here we get all the information to conclude what is the condition for controllability and what is the condition for um, the, on the adjoint uh, operator. So this is the small lemma which gives me the so-called observability inequality. Yeah. You imagine it as a vector in Rn. Okay, simplest is if you take it as a ODE, it's evolving in Rn. So yt is a vector in Rn. If you are in a PDE, then there is a x dependence. That's what I was trying to caution here. Uh, ah, yeah, 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 notation. Okay, I changed suddenly from x to y because I wanted to, yeah, here I have written in xt, yeah. So here I went to yt because it was the adjoint equation. So this is the solution of the adjoint equation I denote by yt. The solution of the original equation I have denoted by xt. But both are evolving in the same Hilbert space, either Rn or some uh, L2 or Hilbert space. Exactly. I'm trying to use this to build ut to do what I want. If I'm starting from x naught, can I reach x1? 
So that will involve some uh, jugglery here. I'll write it as ut into b star of yt. But I knew what was b star of yt. So that will give me certain adjoint of some operator. So that's the condition I'm trying to which can be easily verified in, uh, in the case of uh, PDEs or ODEs. So if the solutions of the adjoint system satisfy this um, condition, that is yt is any terminal vector and this y is the solution evolving from that yt and it's acting on b star. So this y is the solution of the adjoint problem. If it satisfies this condition, so you see this uh, is a bound below then the original system is exactly controllable. So we have transferred the problem to an inequality. Why it is important? Because in the PDE situation, inequalities are uh, more uh, uh, easy to look for. I mean, they are difficult, but you have plenty of toolbox to apply various inequalities. So we want to formulate this in terms of inequalities. In the case of ODEs, we could formulate it through rank condition and uh, other things because you know rank nullity theorem and so it's easy to write down Kalman rank condition and that will give you the controllability which is well known. But for the PDE, I don't have an equivalent rank condition. So we are trying to use the same idea to get, transfer it into inequality. Okay, so a little proof if you go through that L operator is the C. This tells me some map is continuous. Now, what is that map? That map takes uh, yt to, I mean, b star of y to yt. That is what I have written. L uh, is the linear map which is taking ut to h star given by this map. And then by assumption, this map is bounded. So this, I will put it in the, in the previous slide, I went back, yeah, I used this relation and uh, this operator L, uh, finally I will give, give an expression for U comes out to be L star of X1. If I choose U to be L star of X1, you can verify from the earlier identity, I will get XP equal to X1. So what it means is by looking at the adjoint and putting some condition, verifying some condition, I am able to uh, check the controllability. Similarly, null controllability because I want to, what is null controllability? I start from any x naught and I reach the origin, zero. So that is uh, much weaker than exact controllability. Exact controllability means you can reach any point. In null controllability, you want to reach only zero. Because for certain systems, zero is only the reachable state. Any point may not be there. Typically like uh, parabolic systems, as soon as you start, your solutions become very, very smooth. And uh, then you can't uh, have the whole space uh, in your range space. So you have to reduce, uh, you have to modify the question. So you ask for null control. So there will be a similar um, condition, but you replace it suitably with uh, to reach zero. Now there is one more in the infinite dimensional setup. You have you may not be able to reach where you want, but uh, you have to settle for something like approximate controllability. I want to reach x1, but it's enough I reach in an epsilon neighborhood of x1. So that is called approximate controllability. For many systems, this is the best we can do. So, and this is good enough for practical purposes, but anyway, because anyway we are getting only approximate solutions, everything is approximate. So, this is good enough for practical situation. So, this is weaker than the earlier two concepts. So, here what happens is the reachable states only form a dense subset. If you recollect earlier, I said the whole of an image is kernel of Ft star, but now I am going to say the closure is only the kernel. So the, this is true if and only if the null space of Ft star is zero. Now this is what I want to check in my PDE system. So let me explain what is what does this mean. So if for the solutions of the adjoint system, so this was uh, the B star of Yt, if you remember, uh, that was Ft star. That is I calculated a certain uh, adjoint that came out to be B star of Yt. B was the control operator. Now, if this function is identically zero, then yt must be zero. Then the, if this condition holds, then the original system will be approximately controllable. 
Why is it true? This is easy to verify for most of the PDE system. That is what we are going to use in our system. Why if this is true? Let us see. Suppose this is, you have the condition, but my original system is not approximately controllable. I try to get a contradiction, okay. So suppose not, if it is not, uh, that means uh, the, the image is not the whole. Uh, so what I can do is I can pick up a YT, which is orthogonal to every XT. XT is sitting in the range, right? So the range is not covering the whole, the closure of the range is not covering the whole space. So something must be sitting orthogonal to that. So that means for every uh, control, I, this will be zero. That means the right hand side is zero. The right hand side I use using ut b star, I throw the b on the other one, b star of yt, this integral is zero. Now I invoke the condition. What does the condition say? The b star of yt is identically zero. So that means this must be zero for any control u and hence uh, thus this will tell me this whole thing will be zero and hence yt also must be zero. So this inequality, this uh, using this uh, same identity which I derived by comparing original and adjoint, we are able to use this condition to conclude a contradiction which means yt must be zero. And that is what I wanted uh, in particular. So this is what I am going to check in my uh, system. But before going ahead, let me explain the idea in a simple ODE case so that we understand how to use the Laplace transform and then we move to the PDE model. So the, for the finite dimensional operators, everything is much simpler because we have 1, 1 if and only if on 2, right? The rank nullity theorem will tell you that which means uh, the Kalman rank condition, which is well-known condition, which I didn't mention here, is the one which gives you controllability. And you have exact controllability, null, null controllability, and approximate, all three are equivalent. All notions are equivalent. And the easiest to check is Kalman rank condition. But anyway, I will explain how to check my, this condition, what I mentioned, that B star of yt is 0, yt, this condition in the case of an ODE, just to understand the idea. So why approximate controllability is equal to exact controllability? I have said every subspace, uh, of, uh, the subspace of the reachable states is dense. And any dense space, uh, and uh, it, it's going to be the whole space because it's a closed uh, finite uh, subspace, finite dimensional subspace, and hence it's going to be the whole space. So the approximate controllability will be equal to exact controllability. Suppose you say A star has n number of eigenvalues lambda k and let me assume that uh, these are all simple and the eigenvectors are vk, then you have an eigenfunction expansion. So I can write any vector yt which I am going to choose as the terminal value as a linear combination of alpha k vk. So if I write, uh, if I start from yt, my adjoint uh, system, what was the, this was the adjoint system, now it is ODE, okay. So I am starting from yt, then I can write down the solution in this way. So that will be alpha k vk e power uh, lambda kt. So this will be the solution. Now what is given if, so the, I need a condition to conclude approximate controllability. So I have written this condition, but it will be clear when you go to the next slide. So suppose that B star of yt is identically zero, I would like to verify that u is zero, the yt is zero. So I multiply it by u times uh, uh, B star of yt will also be zero for every t because for any control u. So I put it in the expansion, so this was the expansion, so I multiplied this uh, by uh, uh, u, so I have a u times b star of vk of e power lambda k is 0. But I have a sum of exponentials. Now what I want to do is, I want to conclude this, uh, I go to the previous side, what I want to do is, this yt is also 0. Now to conclude yt is 0, I have to conclude all the alpha k's are 0, all the coefficients are 0. So, but I have the coefficients in the sum. So from the whole sum is 0, I would like to conclude each coefficient is 0. 
so the from this finite sum of exponential how to conclude each coefficient is zero so one useful tool uh, in such a situation is laplace transform but of course it's too much here but it's uh, good to convey the idea so this is identically zero so it's laplace transform is also identically zero so uh, the laplace transformed variable is with respect to mu okay so i have uh, multiplied by e power minus mu t the this and uh, integrated from zero to infinity this is our laplace transform now you integrate it out, Every, these are all independent of t, so I pull it out and only the t dependence is coming from e power lambda k minus mu t and that will throw a 1 upon lambda k minus mu. Now remember mu is a complex variable, so if I look at this function, this function is going to have poles at each of the lambda k. So now that reminds me that the Cauchy uh, formula might give me, capture the pole around the poles, the residue theorem will give me the something. So this is a meromorphic function with poles at lambda k. So if I choose a contour k uh, gamma enclosing just one lambda k, everywhere else this is a nice uh, uh, analytic function. So this side I will get the coefficient which is independent of the the z and uh, the finally I will get alpha k 2 pi i and that will be the residue and this side it was integrated out over the contour uh, gamma of mu. But I said uh, this was 0 so its Laplace transform was 0 and hence this integral over the contour is also 0 and that has isolated this alpha k and hence this alpha k must be 0 this you can do for every k provided you have a u naught which uh, the scalar product with each of b star v k is not zero. Then I can conclude this is not zero and hence the alpha coefficients are zero. So roughly this is the idea we want to use uh, from uh, to verify that condition what I said. Uh, I have I will have an exponential sum and I will have to conclude each coefficient is zero. And I need an analytic function and after the taking Laplace transform, I would like to conclude the coefficient using uh, Cauchy's residue theorem. So this, let me see, let us put it in the, uh, in a PDE model. Everything will be more complicated because there will be x dependence and t dependence. So let us see what happens uh, here. So I want to view the PDE as an ODE evolving in an infinite dimensional space. So I have to fix the space correctly. And here now the three controllability notions are very different. I have to decide which one I want to check. And then generally the philosophy is hyperbolic PDEs are like wave equation. It is exactly controllable. Transport and wave equations are exactly controllable for t sufficiently large depending on the geometry of the domain. And parabolic equation like heat equation, you have to ask null controllability and you will have null controllability for any t positive. So these are all well known. So we use this to ask the right question for our system which is going to be a coupled system. So if this, the another hint is if you have a spatial operator which has a discrete spectrum and the eigenfunction expansion holds, then I may be able to write the yt, the terminal value in an expansion of eigenfunctions but it will be infinite now and I want to use uh, the idea of uh, Laplace transform to this infinite sum of uh, eigenfunctions and then take uh, the exponential and try to conclude uh, what I want. So can we extend the ODE case arguments to PDE for approximate control? So this is the question I want to answer. So typically I will use B to be the interior localization operator which is a characteristic function of a smaller sub, uh, subset omega of the big uh, open set uh, big omega. Then for approximate controllability what is the condition? The condition is the solution yxt vanishes on this cylinder then does y vanish everywhere on the big uh, domain. So let me draw a picture. I have a uh, I have, uh, let's say this is my omega and I have, uh, the, this is my uh, time, uh, let's say this is uh, time, 
P. So I can view it as a cylinder around omega. But now there is a small little omega where we are controlling. And then I have a smaller cylinder. Okay. So this is the smaller cylinder on which uh, you are given the solution is vanishing. Okay. So the solution is vanishing here. And uh, we want to conclude the solution vanishes everywhere in the big cylinder. Now, these type of results are uh, known as unique continuation results. That is, you know solution, some function vanishes in a small set, subset, whether it is zero in the whole set. This unique continuation results uh, for the time independent case, we have seen for eigenfunctions of uh, Laplacian. So, if this is omega, and uh, if it vanishes in any omega uh, subset, it will be vanishing on the whole of omega. You can do for the eigenfunctions of the such equations from the time independent case, you can use the analyticity. There the function is analytic and uh, if uh, it has uh, the zeros of analytic functions are isolated. So if it has a big zero set, an open set, it must be zero everywhere. You could use such arguments. Now for the time dependent case, so again we look for some analyticity and can you use some arguments from complex analysis to conclude extent that it must be zero everywhere. So these are the unique continuation property which is what I have to verify to conclude my approximate controllability. So keep it in mind but then now we will move to the model uh, PDE model. So is this, so what are the difficulties here? The solution defined as an infinite sum, can I extend it for all t positive? Uh, I don't know because for the, in the case of uh, ODE, it was the simple exponential matrix e power a t and it is defined for all t. So here also I should, I need it for all t, then only I can take a Laplace transform and then can we take the Laplace transform for the infinite sum and uh, integrate term by term. And can we use the residue theorem to isolate the coefficients? So let us see how we do it. So the model is uh, viscoelastic flow. So let me explain a little bit about the flow. So the fluid velocity is u and the constant density is rho. The pressure is p, the stress tensor is tau. So the conservation of mass and momentum or this is the, uh, the continuity equation gives you this first one rho ut. So u is a function of x and t. I have not written the arguments, but it's a function of x and t. And tau is the stress, which is also a function of x and t pressure. And uh, we need a constitutive law, which will relate the symmetric tens uh, stress tensor to the motion. To complete the system, I need this constitutive law. And usually in linear viscoelasticity, it is assumed in this form. So they assume the, there is a, in the, what are viscoelastic fluids? They are different from the usual Newtonian fluid we see. This is, you can imagine the paste or ketchup or anything which is gooey, which doesn't flow freely is viscoelastic. There is something preventing it from flowing freely. That is this stress tensor. So controlling the viscoelastic fluid is plastic emulsions. Industrially, these are very important problems, but it's very difficult because controlling the stress tensor is always a problem. So the model, linear model, uh, is taken to be, uh, the, this is the symmetric, symmetric part of the uh, gradient of uh, velocity, and that is uh, convolved with the kernel, okay. So in the Newtonian fluid, it is taken to be del G is delta or I take it to be just the symmetric part of the, uh, the velocity vector. So this is how we get the Newtonian model. But you may add for the Maxwell's theory of linear elasticity where it uses a kernel which is e power minus lambda s. So with this kernel, I get a different uh, stress which will be, it's like having a memory effect. The stress remembers what happened uh, previously. So the fluid uh, flow is affected by the, the memory term. So the stress tensor satisfies an ODE now. So tau t plus lambda t is lambda tau is given by kappa is some constant, a fluid constant, uh, so this uh, symmetric part of the uh, velocity vector. So if I put it in, this will be the viscoelastic system for u and tau. So what is the Jeffreys model? 
in Jeffrey's model, uh, the stress is taken to be a combination of linear combination of Newtonian uh, stress as well as Maxwell stress. If you remember, the Newtonian stress was just this portion, and the, Jeff, the Maxwell stress have, came from the ODE. Okay, so if I put it in uh, together, so I can write tau new, new coming from Newtonian stress, and this is the Maxwell stress. So the Maxwell model will have this extra equation. The Maxwell model, we assume it to be no Newtonian stress at all, only Maxwell stress. So what is the difference in the final system? So I have a system either in R2 or R3. So you will have the fluid, uh, which is very much um, like um, Stokes problem with the stress here and the eta times Laplacian of u and this is going to be the control term f uh, in acting on the characteristic I mean uh, acting on the domain o which is a subset of uh, big omega and the divergence condition is this so we are taking incompressible fluid so divergence of u is zero and u is zero on the boundary of the domain and this is coming from the Maxwell uh, stress uh, assumption which is an ODE for the stress uh, tensor. Now the stress is always a tensor, it's uh, like a matrix you can imagine. So gradient of u, u was a vector already, u1, u2 or u1, u2, u3. So the gradient of u is going to be a matrix. So this side is always a matrix. So this will be, so that is why I'm saying tau stress is a tensor here. This is a tensor equation and uh, u dot initial conditions for uh, velocity and um, stress tensor. Now f is, you notice that velocity and stress, there are two variables. We would like to control only the velocity, but control both the variables. So that is the, and it is an internal control. We would like to control both the variables. Now, what is this eta doing? The eta, if I switch on the eta, if it is a positive number, I get a Jeffreys system where it's a combination of Newtonian as well as Maxwell. If we switch off the U eta, the Laplacian term vanishes and then it is uh, purely a Maxwell system. Now, they are uh, both, the types are very different PDEs. So if you imagine that it's ut minus Laplacian of u is a typical parabolic part. So a typical parabolic part, I told you it will be null controllable and you can expect approximate controllability also there. And if eta is zero, this regularizing term is gone. So it will be purely a hyperbolic part and you may be able to get exact controllability. So these are some of the intuitions we could by looking at the system. Now, what does the experimental data for the viscoelastic fluid indicate? So, one relaxation mode may not be enough because when you see a plastic emulsion going, it goes in several directions. So, the, to fit the experimental data, so they decided you may need several relaxation modes which they call by putting tau1, tau2, tau n. So several uh, tau uh, equations can be added. So either single relaxation mode or several relaxation mode, this seems to better fit the experimental data. Or you could also leave it to be infinite relaxation mode, satisfy, all satisfying this uh, ODE, which came from Maxwell's uh, stress tensor assumption. Okay, so these are the models. Now what are the results known? Um, Renardi has uh, looked at this uh, earlier for one dimensional uh, multi-mode linear Jeffreys uh, and Maxwell system with the localized interior control. But it was one dimensional and uh, the exact controllability for single mode Maxwell fluids. So that's what I said Maxwell uh, will not have this eta term. So it will be like more like hyperbolic and this will also like hyperbolic so you can expect exact controllability and he got the approximate contro controllability for multi-mode Maxwell and Jeffreys. Uh, now there were also other people Dubova and Fernandez Cara they had considered higher dimensional but single mode Jeffreys. It, there uh, it is expected approximate controllability but they got it only for one variable which is velocity not uh, for the stress and uh, they also got for higher dimensional single mode Maxwell 
which we expect to be exactly controllable, they got exact controllability, but with a strong assumption on the system. So this was not complete as a result. So we also had a result from uh, Renardi, he, which uh, the result says, no observability estimate possible in any Sobolev norm for Jeffreys or multimode Maxwell models. What it means is, I told you right in the beginning, <laughs> there must be an inequality. If you recollect that I called as observability inequality in the abstract setup. Yeah, this is the observability inequality. And this will tell me about exact controllability or null controllability. So his result was negative. He's, the, it shows you cannot expect observability estimate in any Sobolev norm. Not by, by changing uh, the function space, we cannot get over the difficulty. So by looking at all the results, so what is the story so far? So you can see Jeffreys and multimode Maxwell system are expected to be approximate controllable only because this is the best result expected for this system because there is no observability estimate. You can't expect more than this. At least we should be able to prove this. And approximate controllability, I should be able to get for both the variables. And single mode Maxwell uh, is expected to be exactly controllable without any extra assumption. And what we realized by looking at the earlier ones, the integral term tau, see tau was satisfying an ODE. So it's very tempting to integrate it out and then use the integral term. If we integrate it out, it was too restrictive. We could not go beyond a certain point. So we tried to... Um, <clears throat> modify the system uh, by using another transformation. So our approach was rewrite the system in a more tractable way, check if the operator or at least its restriction to a subspace generates an analytic semigroup because we wanted an analytic semigroup so that I can go for a Laplace transform. Then we analyze the spectrum and look for an eigenfunction expansion and then use Laplace transform and then Cauchy residue theorem to prove a unique continuation type result for the transformed system. Because the unique continuation type result will tell me approximate controllability which we are after. And then we have to conclude for the original system. So let me see in the remaining time how much I can explain. So the, tra uh, <clears throat> the transformation that what we used I'm trying to motivate now so you see tau xt, tau xt can be when you integrate the ODE, it can be written as the initial tau naught plus the right hand side which now is in this form. Okay? So if, the, if tau naught was not there, then it will always, this tau will always be in the symmetric tensor. It will be because this is symmetric in x, it's going to be always in the symmetric uh, form. So this is the important observation. The integral term always lies in the space of tensors which are symmetric part of gradient of divergence free vectors vanishing on the boundary. Because the u, remember u was divergence free and u was a vector which is vanishing on the boundary and we took the symmetric part of that and we are integrating. So the tau will have all those properties. So tau will always be in the symmetric part of, of the symmetric part of the gradient uh, uh, of a divergence free vector and it will have to vanish on the bone. So then it motivates you to look for tau in this form. So that will be gradient v plus gradient v transpose. These are all now matrices, okay, functions of x and t but uh, the matrix valued. So these are, v must be divergence free vector and the v must be vanishing on the boundary. So if you use tau should be in this form, our system simplifies to a large extent. So you plug it in and the tau equation now goes into a v equation. So that will be vt plus lambda v plus ku. It is a lot more symmetric now. u is also similar. Uh, then we are able to handle this system much better. The, uh, so let us, let me write down um, some function spaces, but um, just bear with me. Uh, this is a div divergence free function space. It is like the basic L2 space. You have to impose the condition that gradient u, the divergence of u is zero. And correspondingly, I have to put the condition on the boundary, which is the, the 
uh, what is divergence theorem will impose that u dot n better vanish on the boundary, right. So, v1 is the analog of h1, but with the divergence free condition. So, we are basically in L2 H1 setup, but in the divergence free setup. And in this setup, this is well known that uh, Stokes equation has to be considered with the Lerae projector P because you have to take any L2 function, project it onto the divergence free space. Then the Stokes operator is nothing but the Laplacian, but projected onto the divergence free space. So, this A naught is a very good uh, operator practically like Laplacian. So, it will have all the properties of Laplacian like discrete spectrum, uh, orthonormal basis of eigenfunctions and analytic etc. So, domain of A naught we can write down and then for my Jeffreys system, now the operator A I can write it as uh, some uh, because I have two components right U and V. So, uh, that u and v will act on uh, this matrix will act on u and v. So, these are all differential operators. A naught is like Laplacian and uh, A1 and this is just identity, okay. So, since the Laplacian generates a semigroup, uh, we could show that A also generates an analytic C0 semigroup on some space. Now, this same result will hold for the adjoint. Now, what is the uh, advantage with the analytic semigroup? The, the spectrum will be in a sector. So, I can, uh, if you have, um, the spectrum usually lies in a se sector. And in the rest of the domain, here in the half plane, my uh, resolvent uh, is going to be an analytic function. We were looking for an analytic function and that is coming through this A. So, let us see how to exploit it. So, the spectral analysis, uh, so I, uh, since I know the eigenvalues of A naught, so we decided to look for the eigenvalues of A through the eigenvalues of A naught. If you plug it in, I get, uh, these are the eigenvalues of the A star strokes operator because I am looking for anal the spectral analysis of the adjoint operator. Because the approximate controllability condition, I have to check for the adjoint operator. So, for each k, the eigenvalues nu k come out to be roots of some quadratic equation involving lambda k which are the eigenvalues of the Stokes operator. I know the Stokes operator uh, eigenvalues are, are like Laplacian, they go off to minus infinity, they are like minus n square and they go off to minus infinity. So, it is similar for uh, <coughs> the, st the Stokes operator. Now, all eigenvalues are, but this is our, my operator is not self-adjoint. So, there are some complex eigenvalues appearing and all the eigenvalues are on the left hand side, but I have two classes of eigenvalues. One is convergent, one is divergent and eigenfunctions are not forming an orthonormal basis, but anyway, they are forming a Ries basis, which is um, a, an image of an orthonormal basis, but you can still get um, the image of an orthonormal basis under a linear transformation, but I still have an eigenfunction expansion. So, uh, this is uh, an idea of, uh, to get an uh, idea of the spectrum. So, I have some complex eigenvalues and uh, there is one set of eigenvalues which are converging to some limit point and another set of eigenvalues which are going off to infinity. Now, this is typically like uh, the parabolic part or uh, heat operator of uh, coming for Stokes operator, so it are Laplacian. So, it is going into minus infinity, okay. So, now for the Jeffreys system, what, so you recollect what we are trying to do. Uh, I will assume that uh, some, um, now I want to, con so there is also another uh, complication here. I have two variables, sigma and uh, phi for the adjoint uh, system. And you remember that uh, original system had u and v, but I, we wanted to control only the velocity and should be able to control both uh, u and v, that is velocity and stress. So, here also the information that what you can assume something is zero is only one component corresponding to the component which you are controlling. So, only the first component is assumed to be zero, that is in this middle cylinder it is zero and we would like to prove uh, both the solutions that is sigma t, phi t from the terminal values from where you started, both must be 0. 
so this is the type of unique continuation we are trying so as i as we did in the ode case i have to write the solution to the um, the adjoint system using the eigen function expansion and then see whether i can take the laplace transform so the solution i have written that e power capital t minus t a star now this is not uh, an exponential matrix but i am denoting the uh, the semi group uh, generated by the analytic uh, semi group a, uh, the solution operator corresponding to the a as e power uh, the a, a star okay so this is acting on the terminal value sigma t phi t and this I know is analytic in T because my operator, uh, the semi group was an analytic semi group. So, this is analytic in T in a sector containing the positive T axis as A star generates the analytic semi group. Now, by analytic continuation, I can extend the whole of sigma to O cross 0 infinity. See, the or originally it is given, sigma was given only up to 0 to capital T. So I can extend it to 0 to infinity I using an argument of analytic continuation. So now I plug it in. So what is the solution sigma? Uh, I have written it out in terms of the eigenfunction components. Sigma eigenfunctions are sigma k1, sigma k2 corresponding to mu k, mu k1. You remember there were two types of um, uh, sequences I have to consider because one was diverging to minus infinity, one was converging. So those are the mu k1 and mu k2 corresponding to those eigenfunctions sigma k1, sigma k2. Now I have to analyze what happens when I take the Laplace transform. So this is given to be 0. So its Laplace transform will also be 0. So as before I write it out, I get mu minus mu k1, mu minus mu k, this must be mu k2. Uh, 2, there is a typo, this must be mu k2. So I have two terms, an infinite uh, sum of this whole thing um, is 0, but I have uh, this sigma ki, this restricted to O is non-zero, okay. And uh, the coefficients are uh, non-zero, so that is what uh, I have taken. And using the, now I would like to say whether using the residue theorem, which I am not showing here for lack of time. So finally, I will have to uh, find a contour which will enclose only mu k1 or mu k2 and then uh, single out alpha k1, sigma k1. This is not 0. Why this is not 0? Because this is the eigenfunction, this is the component is coming from the eigenfunction of uh, the Stokes operator or uh, in this um, a combination of uh, that and uh, eigenfunctions cannot vanish in the uh, open subset of any domain that I mentioned there. So this al sigma k1 cannot be 0, uh, so that rules out only the possibility is the coefficient is 0. So this is uh, the idea extending to the PDE, so what is the final result you can get? Uh, so if you have a subspace, a suitable subspace, these are all symmetric matrices in uh, D dimension, let us say, is D may be 2 or 3 as I mentioned. So I have to take the initial stress, see the initial stress which is sitting may not be in the same symmetric space. So that will always remain, I have to take it out. In the remaining space, one can control. So whatever uh, you are, tau r is the final value you want to reach, you can reach it as epsilon close uh, in time t, that is in a suitable uh, space norm by choosing a, um, choosing a localized interior control f for only one uh, variable and for any initial condition you are able to come as close as you want to this. So that will be the final uh, result which you can extend to several and infinite. Uh, okay, so the other one is slightly out of, uh, but I wanted to just show the, um, the spectrum. So here uh, the transformed system for divergence free UV vanishing on the boundary. If you remember Maxwell system, we do not assume there is a Newtonian force. So the, we expect it to be completely um, hyperbolic. So hyperbolic uh, equations are usually exactly controllable. 
So we want to, we are expecting some exact controllability result, but let us look at the spectrum first to have an idea. So spectral analysis as before using the eigenvalues of the Stokes operator. So the convergent real part and divergent imaginary part, it changes. Now the system can be reduced to this form. Now this is an interesting form because uh, I have um, VTT minus Laplacian, which is typically like the wave operator. But I have a damping term or what lambda VT a perturbation of a lower order term. So what happens to this equation? Is it also exactly controllable? That is what we wanted to know. So look at the spectrum now. This is uh, now it's no more sectorial. I said earlier it was uh, in a sector that is typical of analytic semigroup. We don't have analytic semigroup anymore. And the spectrum is uh, now complex and it's going to minus infinity and plus infinity plus infinity and minus infinity in the imaginary axis. And uh, there is another one which uh, converges, um, which uh, convergent real part and divergent imaginary part. So this is a typical uh, similar to the wave operator. So we used a slightly different argument. Uh, so what we wanted to do is exact controllability persists under compact perturbations of infinitesimal generator provided the whole uh, perturbed equation is approximately controllable. So we used uh, this uh, to show for the whole system approximate controllability. We used uh, Holmgren theorem because we don't have analytic semigroup and so on plus uh, etc. So I just quickly multi-mode uh, Maxwell system is uh, now it is interesting because it's a combination of both. Uh, the earlier uh, where we used the Laplace transform argument and then we used the uh, hyperbolic uh, equation argument. Now it's a combination. The spectrum is typical. You see this is similar to single mode Maxwell, but this is similar to Jeffreys, which was going like a parabolic part. So we try to separate out the solution into two parts, project it onto the um, yeah, so we try to separate the system into analytic semigroup part and one is damped wave equation use try to combine it uh, together and uh, then again I use Laplace transform and so it's more complicated I won't go into that the summary of the results are uh, like this and uh, mainly the Jeffrey system where you used Laplace transform to get approximate controllability and exact so I'll uh, there are some more uh, questions which we don't know how to answer, but it's more in the control direction. So I'll stop here. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Um, so what happens? Uh, is there a modification of these arguments when you have more to the spectrum than just eigenvalues? If you have uh, continuous spectra, uh, the continuous spectrum case we have not uh, thought about because uh, we our argument as you see was very much on the eigenfunction. So there must be an integral transform where you should be able to carry out this argument. But I don't have an example of uh, an operator which has uh, some discrete, some continuous spectrum where I could try all this. But it would be a good idea to, because then I'll uh, land uh, at the same integral transform what you were doing. I don't know. For our speaker? Is it possible to find uh, stable and unstable modes using the eigenvalue spectrum? Yeah, uh, in this case, luckily everything was stable. Everything was on the left half plane. But it is, uh, the, see, this was a very, um, we were lucky because we could uh, use the eigenvalues of the Stokes operator to analyze the behavior of the eigenvalues. If your operator has some such um, underlying um, known spectra, you may be able to find uh, and then you can find out what is stable, which is stable, which is unstable. So the theory. So the theory is known for Hamiltonian systems, or can you control? Is it is it any different? Because all of these systems are dissipative, right? They're all dissipative. Yeah. What happens if you have a 
Hamiltonian structure on your good computer. question. I really I haven't looked up. Uh, I'll look up and tell you. I really I have not looked at Hamiltonian systems because we were always with uh, Navier Stokes, mm -hmm. which is a dissipative uh, system, and I have not uh, looked beyond that. I will look up. Maybe I'll just add, add a comment. Um, I mean, if you're going to control something, uh, you're probably going to break the Hamiltonian structure. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you're going to add an extra term to your equation, right? So usually you start off with an equation and then you have this control uh, term, this B U of T. Um, uh, generically, that would break the, the structure. Could you ask for, um, uh, you know, a structure preserving control? I think that's a very interesting question and I don't know the, I don't know the answer to that. Because right now we were looking at periodic solutions. Whatever we want to stabilize, you want to stabilize to a fixed point. You can also stabilize to a periodic. So how do you put a periodic control to move towards a periodic solution? That's what we are trying to see. So maybe it's, a relevant question, but I have not looked. There are certainly a question. So, if you, as, as a physical example, suppose you have the water wave problem, which is Hamiltonian, and then you say, I want to create certain types of waves. As an experimentalist, you have a wave tank and you say, I want to create certain types of waves. Um, the, the experimentalist has a paddle, which is usually thought of as a boundary control. So you're forcing this, um, and that's a very obvious uh, question that you now have to answer. Can you attain all waves? How do you uh, actually decide what the control is? Uh, there's one uh, work along this direction which says if you can uh, sort of prescribe the pressure at the free surface of the fluid, you can choose the pressure such that you will create a particular wave. However, the proof is non-constructive. It shows that there exists a control, but it's not constructive. So um, these are very interesting questions, and I, I, yeah, I, I, they're also very, very technical to answer. Probably also won't get uh, uh, null controllability for Hamiltonian systems, right? You would only get approximate. It's always conservative, right? So you will stay on the right. surface. For a speaker. All right, if not, we can thank Maithili for a wonderful talk.